Hello and welcome to The Rest is Football with me, Gary Lineker, Micah Richards and Alan Shearer. On today's episode, we have a special guest with us. He's uh, probably Britain's best known football journalist, a man who's had a long and extremely distinguished career, starting at the Independent in 1986. What a year that was. Uh, he spent 20 plus years at The Telegraph before becoming the chief football writer uh, in 2015 at The Times. That stint has just ended. Uh, we await the next move uh, with interest. He is, of course, uh, Henry Winter. Henry, welcome. Thank you. It's, it's fantastic to see you. I've chased you guys around car parks, Alan around golf courses, <laughs> inevitably, <laughs> Micah across Leeds. Gary across London, so uh, it's it's nice to sort of have you sort of encased here. Yeah. You can't escape. Now, this is a little bit different. Um, we're interviewing you. Yeah, I know, I know. I'm a bit scared. Don't be scared uh, at all, Hendry. Uh, f- uh, firstly, um, you know, it came a bit of a shock, obviously, um, uh, last week uh, to us all. I presume you're already getting a stream of offers. Not quite a stream. I think there should be a transfer window for for, for journalists. Um, no, I, I've got I've got a couple of things lined up. I'm going to the Euros, which is the most important thing because you know my love of this job is well is obviously club football, but is England. And you look at this England squad. You guys will know better than than me. You look at Jude Bellingham's performance, Phil Foden's performance, and we seem to have about sort of five or six, seven, eight players now who'll happily step up and take a penalty. And you know they're they're just such a good bunch. So I didn't want to miss out on this tournament. France and Portugal and you know there, there's some terrific teams out there probably Germany might surprise a few particularly on home soil but this England team have got a trophy in them and, and I, having been to 14 tournaments covering England and sort of you know suffered from afar with you guys um, I just want to see them with luck well not with luck with hard work bring a, bring a trophy home um, just over your shoulder in fact both shoulders you've got you've got a flag um which uh, um, hopefully this side will have a bit more luck than that one did in the end. Um, e- explain what's behind you, Henry. Well, it's the, it's the first World Cup I covered, so Italia 90, and uh, I was just at the Independent, very sort of down table, very junior, and I said, can I go and write some stuff there? And uh, they weren't covering every game. I mean, the, the media landscape is totally different now. I mean, you, you look at you guys with your podcasts, with your television programs, it's just been completely sort of tran- transformed. So I just went out there and... And uh, I covered amazing games. I mean, I did Brazil against um, Argentina, and was privileged. I mean, you played against him. The, the privilege to uh, to watch Maradona play a pass in the centre circle in Turin, the Stadio degli Alpi, as you know well, with his right foot, his right foot to Claudio Canigia, who ran through and, and beat Tafarel in the Brazilian goal. And moments like that, it, they seem like yesterday. So, yeah, my first World Cup, I, unfortunately, I wasn't covering England, Gary, so I didn't sort of see uh, your, uh, your great, um, you know, your, your amazing performances there. But I did see your debut at Hamden Park in, in 84. I think you came on for Tony Woodcock. You were there, were you? I was there, yeah. I mean, I went with some Scottish friends and uh, when Woodcock equalised, uh, sort of my shoulders went up and I felt some very strong Scottish hands of me down. So, yeah, as, I, mean, I was a student up there, but, you know, just... Just, just as a fan of England and, and then as a reporter of England, um, I think it's probably the one area, and I think if you ask any of the England journalists, they say where you write partly with your heart as well as your head. Were you ever a footballer, Henry? Did you ever play when you were young? Because I think most sports journalists often are failed sportsmen. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, fair, fair point. I mean, the world I came from um, was not exactly the most sort of athletic of uh, of backgrounds. Uh, my my family, stretching way back, were all sort of academics, academics, architects, artists, designers. So, uh, I mean, I played at university. I played East of Scotland League. I still got the sort of the scars of going around sort of Hoyk, Roll Albert and Gala Fairy Dean. But yeah, it was, I mean, it was good. Some of those teams now, like Spartans, are, are in the sort of, you know, the, the higher up the Scottish pyramid but no I mean I was absolutely hopeless in fact I was um, captain of the uh, the England press team and until I lost the dressing room after about half an hour so uh, no <laughs> absolutely no ability whatsoever but the good thing is is because it was never a uh, and never a possibility for me. And all my mates at schools were going off and, you know, I mean, some of them uh, went off and became writers, politicians, lawyers, people in the military, one or two rock stars. I mean, we had a quite a sort of gilded year at school. 
but none of them really went into to, to, to sport. So that was never an issue. So when I've sort of covered your career, there's never been that element of, of me going, oh, I wish that was me, just simply admiring your work ethic. You know, I'm, I, can, I can remember Alan. I mean, Alan, it seems like only yesterday, you're a 96, those interminable friendlies leading up to it. And, and Terry, God, God rest his soul, Terry Venables, was just sort of working with you, you playing these games, game after game, all those friendlies at Wembley, with your back to goal, getting a kicking, working on that partnership with, uh, with, with Sherry. Failing to score, Henry, failing, failing to, to score. score in, in about 13 <laughs> games. But then, then, this is, then this is my point, yeah. the sort of the work ethic and determination of, of Alan, Mike and you, and you Gary. You know, uh, it's it's fascinating to see and to chronicle. And I can remember walking across the car park with Alan after one of the, the games. And I think your, your dad was there, Alan. And you were hobbling. You'd taken an absolute battering. But your determination just sort of exuded from you. So, look, I came from quite a sort of privileged background. I was a choir boy in Westminster Abbey and all that sort of stuff. So to actually meet people who kind of in the real world, actually, if I'm being honest, but just that work ethic. And all three of you have taught me, and I've learned so much in this game, uh, you've taught me that there's no such thing as luck. Like Micah, your work from a, from a young age, how you came through, that passion, that drive. You know, Gary, yourself, you know, I'm not just sort of blowing smoke up you because I'm on, but, but it's taught me so much that that work ethic, when people say, well, I talk to footballers and say I was lucky, that's there just them being modest the background of hard work, Gary, how you worked on, you know, making those runs, the intelligence of, of your movement. Alan, you know, day in, day out, those friendlies, you know, you took an absolute battering. And when it mattered most for England, you came good in that tournament. Henry, you've, you've been around, as it seems, all my career and, and most of, well, everyone's, it seems. But tell us the huge changes that you've seen from players, and particularly attitudes, uh, more so because I would imagine whenever you asked me for an interview, I always gave you one. What were these two reprobates like? You wouldn't get the same <laughs> attitude from those two. You gave me one of my best interviews, Alan, because I had to chase you around Venice. And, and when you realised that most of the roads were full of water, you, uh, you, no, you were brilliant. I think you were doing some, you, you were doing some event with Umbro. And I think we were based near um, Venice. And uh, so anyway, no, you were brilliant. I mean, Micah, Gary, I mean, you know, the, the interviews. I remember Micah during the start of lockdown. And this is, again, what I've learned from footballers. And I have arguments with sort of my non-footballing mates who are like rugby fans, cricket fans, you know, good jobs, good people. And they just go, oh, footballers. And I go, and I just, I'll be sort of shouting across the sort of the dinner table, trying to just talk about, like, take Micah, um, just because just Micah's here. I remember at the start of lockdown, I think it was lockdown two, you know, there was a real concern about the mental health of young people in this country. And I think, Micah, you tweeted, here's 25 grand for, for a sort of a, a mental health support charity in Leeds, you know, a city you know well. Ditto, I think you gave 25 grand to another uh, charity, mental health support charity in, um, in, in Manchester as well. I mean, you know, Gary, the work that you do, you know, which and I could probably read off a string of the, uh, the, the people that you've worked for, you know, because, because I've done pieces with you down the years, Prince's Trust, you know, sort of cancer, you know, I mean, Alan, with your foundation and, and your, uh, you, I think you've still got the Alan Shearer Centre. And I, I mean, on a very humble level, I'm doing the, um, the marathon this weekend for the Sir Bobby Robson Foundation and, and the, 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 you know, the work that you guys have done. But particularly with like Marcus Rashford, because of the world that I grew up in, because I grew up in Westminster, you know, you get to know one or two people. And I got to know one or two people um, around Boris Johnson, around the time of Marcus Rashford, when Marcus was doing an amazing thing. F very simply, feeding the kids of this country so that they could go into school and focus, they could study, they could go on and become great people and take the world by storm. Because Marcus Rashford had actually took it on himself because he'd, you know, because of his amazing mother Mel, who worked three jobs to sort of you know feed feed her three three sons, and Marcus took it on himself to go and do that. And I was talking to someone close to Boris Johnson at the time, and um, he was saying, "Well, he's just a footballer," and I say he's a footballer with a passion. 
of he's a footballer with a platform. He's a footballer who's on a mission, who comes from a difficult background and he wants to help. And I, I sort of make, made a rather blithe comment. I said, there's only number t- one number 10 that's going to win this, which I thought was quite a sort of, you know, a, a funny line, but I don't think um, the people from Downing Street really understood. <laughs> so, so again, it comes from, so in a way, you're having a sort of foot in, in both camps. And we see it with the current England players. You know, the, I mean, you, you guys know them well. You've, you've, you've talked to them. You see the things that, you know, that they do for charity and for community. I mean, you look at this England squad and I, I, I think they're fantastic. You, you saw how Jude Bellingham spoke after, uh, after beating City on penalties. You know, you just, they're really good. You know, like your, your three squads were as well. Can I, can I just ask you, Henry... Uh... How how have you found it? Because you, you talked about Alan and, and Gary there, and also myself. But not all journalists are, are likable and relatable. They, but I, I have to be honest because we've had all had a situation where the club wants to. They said X and journalists want to speak to you, and. Normally, the the sort of attitude towards that, no, I'm not speaking to. But I know you've got credibility because you've worked hard at what you've done. But how do you have the likability factor where people want to come and actually speak to you? Um, well, I don't think they always do. Um, but no, it's nice you say that. I think it's trust. And I think I'm fortunate the people I've worked for, they don't put daft headlines on it. I know we're slightly moving generally into a sort of clickbait era, but I also think that footballers are, are clever now. They've all got their own huge platforms. They know the clubs want to use their content on their own, on their club platforms. But they also, if they want to sort of reach a different target audience, um, you know, say in a broadsheet world, they want to get a message through to, to, to Downing Street or wherever, they, they will absolutely... Uh, use us. I mean, again, coming back to Marcus Rashford, I did a couple of pieces with him in lockdown. I can remember ringing him up, and it was in the first lockdown. And I said, "What are you? What are you up to? You've, you know, you're able to train in your garden. Are you able? You're going through clips with a club or whatever." And he said, "No, I'm reading a book on uh, logistics of how you ferry food from supermarkets which have got an excess into distribution hubs, whether it's a, a local church, whether it's a, a school hall, whether so it can then go off to the." And I thought, "Wow! I mean, that is just so, so, so impressive." But so Marcus would have then probably use me in the piece that I did to, again to get his message out there whether that's fundraising that's a, whether that's awareness raising and I think it works I mean I would imagine that there were five six thousand people working full-time in the community departments of the 92 clubs in this country you look at Everton's what what they do you know you you look at Arsenal you know those two are the oldest they do amazing you look at Portsmouth the work they do with dementia you could go all the way down and into non-league as well and I think probably only about 5% of that community charity work that clubs do, that players do, actually gets highlighted. And I've, from very early on, I've gone to players, and partly to take them out of the training ground, to take them out of their sort of, you know, the banter environment, to take them to a place that, you know, maybe where they've been, whether it's in trouble at school, whether it's racism, whether it's my brother's a very well-known um, Muslim cleric, and he's, I think he's 38th or 39th in the world, most influential Muslims in the world, still one place behind Mo Salah. So I've talked to, um, to uh, Muslim players about it and I write about them. So again, they can use me, I hope, in a, in a way to sort of get their, their message out, whatever their message is. Henry, you've been in a world, obviously, um, where there's a difference perhaps from the sports pages to the front pages. Um, does that make your life more difficult when the front pages tend to... You've talked about the positive side of footballers there and the positive side of Marcus Rashford. But on the front pages of the newspapers, that will not necessarily be as positive. It might be very negative. Does that make your life as a sports journalist more difficult? A little bit. I think it's more difficult with the, the tabloids. I mean, we call them tabloids. They will call themselves bigger circulation than ours. Um, yeah, I think it is. I mean, Gary, I can remember doing a, a, an interview with you. And I think it was around the time of the, the you know, when you were uh, very vocal and rightly vocal on this country should show more compassionate support for, for refugees. And um, I knew uh, news were, were going to, uh, to, to look at the piece. Um, 
So I don't think I actually put that stuff high up. And in fact, I think they treated it fairly respectfully. But absolutely, you've got to be aware. I mean, if you do an interview with Beckham, I think I've done maybe one, possibly two with him, you know, back in time, you had to be aware that they would always look at it. But again, I was being lucky at the Independent, the Telegraph and the, uh, and the Times that they're pretty respectful to your copy. How did it all start for you? I, I, I'm asking this, Henry, because... I get so many questions about how to get into broadcasting um, and I don't really have um, the answers apart from I always say, well, you know, write loads of stuff, read loads of stuff, try and get maybe hospital radio, do that kind of local radio thing to get yourself going. Um, but when they talk about journalism, or uh, for me, it's hard to answer because my other answer is like score loads of goals for England and you you might get a job. <laughs> but how how does and I know lots of um, there'll be lots of young listeners to this that want to go into sports journalist journalism. What is the way for them to get into it? How did it happen for you? Well, it happened for me because uh, when I was at school, there was a, an amazing football correspondent of the Times who basically just wandered around the world, uh, wrote about the sort of you know, extraordinary things that had happened to him. I mean, he. You know, this, is, this is Jeffrey Green. I mean, he wrote a piece uh, on an England game. At, at, yeah, I mean, he's a legend. Um, I mean, he used to have a, a Christmas tree in the front room of his cottage in uh, in Richmond. And it, the Christmas tree was up all year round. And he said, oh, dear boy, you know, when you're a football journalist, every day is Christmas Day. <laughs> and, you know, he, he just... I love what he did, which was obviously write about football because he was passionate about that, but also because when he went to it, you know, he did a game at Maracanã and 900 words of a thousand word match report were on this mad cat ride he had in a Brazilian taxi on the way to the airport to Maracanã, which if you've ever done that, you know, having covered it, you know that it's, I mean, it's <laughs> Dodgems times 10. Um, so... Yeah, I, all that. So I wanted from the age of sort of 14, 15 and while all my friends were going off and getting proper jobs. And I came into to football journalism really in 85. And it was the, you know, it was a couple of months after high school and everyone said, what are you doing? And I said, well, it's just, uh, you know, I want to do it. So look, coming back to your point, uh, social media is fantastic. I mean, I get messages all the time, um, like all other journalists, you know, they're, they're young journalists that you look after. Becom's um, Leon Mann's organization, who do a fantastic job um, with particularly young black reporters, bringing them into the game, trying to change. So like when Raheem Sterling came out with his Instagram message the day after the, uh, the incident that he had at Stamford Bridge, that really shook up our industry. And I think the, you know, the, the pathways were made easier to, to, to come in. There are no barriers. If I look around the press box now, when I finally get back into one, I, I will see people from all backgrounds. And I think we're reflecting the sport a bit a, a bit better but in terms of when I talk to them so I take your point Gary about it's it's maybe a bit more actually I think it's easier from the print side because if someone's sitting next to me on the tube and he says I want to be a sports writer I said well open up your phone and show me your most recent blog and I can go through his blog in about five stops on the on the Victoria line and um and just to say well your intro should be use that sentence your payoff should be you know move that up don't go through stats heavy at the top give me a bit of drama give me a bit of color at the top so you know we can do that very quickly now so that's the joys so everyone talks about the negatives of social media but in terms of helping people with their career social media i think has been a real boon henry where where are we where's the state of football now where where's it going what's how's it going to shape and everything else i mean i know you're very pro regulator aren't you which I'm not too sure. Well, I'm even more pro-regulator today when I see what's happened to the FA Cup. Now, I'm not necessarily saying the regulator would actually come in and, and say we need to keep um, replays, but what we need to do is keep the pyramid intact. And I think if you look at um, some of the English players who are still in the, uh, in the Champions League, look at Harry Kane. I mean, Harry Kane had some really important loan periods in the EFL. Look at Jude Bellingham, who was going to go on and become an England great. And, I, and that's not putting extra pressure on a, a young player because you guys have talked to him. You know that he is he, he can absolutely handle that. But you look at his background, you know, Birmingham, the way he came through there. We have to look after the clubs outside the elite. We remember the European Super League, you know, I think... Real Madrid, is, you know, still want to, to bring it in. So on the regulator, Alan, I do think because the FA has been weakened, because the Premier League's become stronger, because, 
the big European clubs have become stronger. And you look at the the Premier League at the moment. I always look at the uh, the Championship clubs who might come up and how many American owners are going to step into the, the Premier League. There's some fantastic American owners out there. I'm not decrying them all. But, you know, I've seen the Glazers close up and I don't particularly like it. And if you actually see if the American model is to spread games around the world, maybe at some point end promotion and relegation, have more of a closed shop. Certainly it's more money spinning. Then if you're going to get 14 American owners in the Premier League, it's all off at Ludlow and anything can happen. So, look, But, the, but the, the Championship is the sixth best funded league in, in Europe. So in terms of being protected and being funded... No, I take your point and it's a, uh, it, it's a great league. I mean, but... It's not simply about the championship. It's about the it's about the berries. It's about the clubs all the way down. And I, you know, if I on those rare occasions that you can actually talk to to Premier League owners, you just say, well, listen, just look at how some of the the, the coaches who have actually sort of climbed to the top. A lot of them have have relied on uh, lower down the pyramid. Look at the players. I and mean, I think it was it. England's last tournament, 26 players there, was it? So 23 of them had, had, you know, were beholden to the EFL. You know, this hashtag made in the EFL. It's so important that we look after the, uh, uh, look after the pyramid. So look, if I'm criticised for fighting for uh, clubs down the pyramids, then, then so be it. If I'm criticised for backing a regulator who might actually stand up because he's got the legal background and the financial background and will stand up to some of the clubs and will also point out, as we've seen this season, um, actually say you are overspending and actually have, you know, keep an eye on their expending in real time rather than at the end of the season. Uh, Henry, you raised the point there about um, the abolishing of um, FA Cup replays. Um, and I understand there'll be a little bit of, of groaning about that from, from smaller clubs. But is possibly the answer to that, I was I was thinking, what how can they make that now fair? Because there's no question we play too much football. So uh, fewer games is definitely a positive, albeit that there's that thing about... Yeah, but the teams that will suffer are the small clubs because it's occasionally their payday. What about wherever you are in the football pyramid, um, the team that are lower in the league or different league, wherever you are, plays at home and gets all all the revenue from that particular fixture as a, as a way around that. It makes sense. You know, even if it's in your own league in the Premier League, if eighth draws tenth, tenth plays at home. If you draw a team from the, the championship, the championship team play at home. Yeah, I get that. But I, I think maybe they're, they're one or two of the players who say we do want our day out at, at Old Trafford. I, I don't want to sort of mess around with the competition too much. And I would actually take to the start of your point. Why should English football simply march to the beat of effectively what will be four clubs? Because I don't think English football is going to get the fifth Champions League place. You know, there's a lot more life outside the elite Champions League clubs. Look, it's fantastic. The title race we've had this season is absolutely brilliant. It's one of the best title races I've seen and covered. But, I, you know, it's <laughs> the world just simply doesn't revolve around three or four clubs. No, and, and Leicester are perfect evidence of that. So um, we'll take a break and uh, more from Henry Winter when we come back. Welcome back to The Rest is Football with Micah Richards, Alan Shearer and today uh, Henry Winter. Uh, Henry, um, a question. Why is sports journalism so important? Why is it important? Um, yes. Why is it important? Wow, because, because of the huge hunger in this country for information about you guys, about the current England team, about clubs on a slightly more sort of, I'm not going to get on a particularly sort of high moral ground because it would, you know, with journalists, it would be a tiny molehill rather than Everest. But I would absolutely say it's, it's holding, you know, it's holding um, power accountable. It's, you know, I've been criticising the Glazers since they arrived in, what was it, 2005? You know, and, and far better journalists than me have been doing extraordinary things. You know, Danny Taylor on the uh, on the abuse of young players um, in the sort of the 70s and 80s. David Conn on sort of financial irregularities. It, it's absolutely vital. And I've done a few pieces in the last sort of 18 months with the Ukrainian players, with Zinchenko in, in particular. Um, and I actually went over just after when the Ukrainian Pro League restarted 
And I went over there. I had to get clearance from the foreign desk who thought I was slightly mad. I had to go on a sort of, you know, hostage training and all these hostile environment awareness courses. And um, I got driven to, to the Polish border, went across, then got a car the other side through all the uh, all the checkpoints. I had an ex-Ukrainian. I had to do the same when I went to guy. Newcastle, Henry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, and you know, but but Lucky just you let you in there, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> but but just to, just to go and see and to report, and it's important to go to, to to these places because you know if if you go into Harvard journalism school, one of the first thing they teach you is if you don't go, you don't know. And it's important that journalists go and report and actually say, look, on far, you know, the, the football sports department of newspapers is known as the toy department. The serious stuff where the bullets are flying, again, that is so important, even more important, that those journalists actually go into the thick of it. So absolutely, it's important for us journalists to, to, go, and, to go and question people. Can I just ask you, Henry, what's your favourite story you've worked on in all your years? Come on. <laughs> I love games and I love the narrative of games. I love the 90 minutes or the 98 minutes now or the, you know, whether it's watching Maradona at, at 90, whether it's watching the, the Scotland game in uh, at Euro 96, whether it's watching Michael Owen scoring one of the greatest goals in the world at France 98. Actually, rewinding, I, I just by chance, I, I saw Saeed Oweren score an amazing goal for Saudi Arabia against Belgium, just running through and slipping the ball past Michel Proutom at, uh, in Washington at, at USA 94. I mean, just so many games. Michael Owen, again, you know, taking the lead, running away from Lucio um, against Brazil in the 2002 World Cup. And then, I mean, 99, I mean, Sir Alex Ferguson's. I mean, that was just extraordinary. I'd written and I was about, to, our printing site at the, the Telegraph was about to press send on more English heartache, Ferguson tactically inept, three central midfielders or three wide <laughs> players. What on earth was he playing at? And then, you know, in the blink of an eye, two blinks of an eye, and then it, it all changed. And uh, <laughs> unfortunately, the Telegraph... How does that like, work, oh, Henry? How does oh, that work well, it's when carnage. something like that happens at the end of the game? You have to, I suppose, rip the page up. And, I suppose you've got most of the match report and then you change the top and you have to change the end. You, well, you change the top. You got, you got, you got, you got ten seconds to ad lib in a dramatic te- late turnaround. Manchester United turned footballing drama and Teutonic supremacy on its head with two late goals. Followed by, in my first edition, nine hundred words criticizing Ferguson. Uh, obviously, the sort of, you know the, the rewrite was slightly easier. But the, the unfortunate thing is, is that obviously they had quite a. They had quite a party at their hotel, rightly in Barcelona, and they were all sort of trooping down to breakfast, probably a little bit hungover. And all the first editions, which got printed out in Spain at the time, were all scattered across the breakfast table. And basically it was just sort of, you know, 30 nice (laughs) words followed by... And at the start of next season, there was a press conference and Ferguson just walked in and raised an eyebrow and went, I saw your first editions. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> before, before we move on Henry before we move on you must know some deep dark secrets with, you. <laughs> with all your experience it's not a question it's just an observation but you must know if you ever need to get out of jail at some stage you must know some, some something deep yeah you wouldn't do it. I mean, I, <laughs> but you I, still know it you know it, but I think you're, you're almost, your reputation is defined by the stories that you don't write. Because all the while, you know, you will be in someone's company and they might say something and they say, don't use that, and you'll never use it. Um, I mean, I wrote one book once and there was an incredibly powerful chapter in it. And then at the end, the person whose book it was, I was ghostwriting it for them, said, I don't want to use that chapter. And not only did I delete the file, I actually just destroyed, I smashed the actual tape with it. Not that I would ever be tempted because I've got too much respect for them. But absolutely, you know, you you do things like that. And, I, you know, I've written books with Gerard and Dalgleish and Barnes and Carrick. And there are things in those books that they might have said, which they then, they wanted taken out. And you go, that's heartbreaking because that were, you know, that is just, 
that will guarantee that book wins an award, but you absolutely respect it. You know, you've got to respect people. You know, trust is so important. Listen, one of the things I've learned in this game is the power of the importance of listening. I don't think I was a very good listener when I came into the game, but listening to people and not necessarily earning their trust, but like going into Stephen Gerrard's house, you know, the privilege of actually going into Gerrard's house in 2006 and spending time with him. And I had 20 hours on the record with him. Every word was absolutely just, I mean, it was just quality. And of course, it also, it was very powerful as well when he started talking about, and this comes back to your question, uh, Micah, and I wouldn't call it a favorite story, but the most powerful story that I've been, that I've written on is Hillsborough. And Stephen suddenly just talked about his cousin, John Paul Gilhooley, who was the youngest of the 97 to, to die at, at Hillsborough. And he spoke so powerfully and a very humbling to, to, to hear that. And then Kenny, obviously, so Kenny Dalgleish now, I did two books with him. He always jokes that if he does another one, he, he gets to keep me. But I mean, Alan, you, you, you know what Kenny's like. You, you know his humour, but you also know how powerful Hillsborough was and is still in his life. And he... He found it difficult. This was in what we did. It was just after he'd won the title with you at, at Blackburn. And this was so it was like 95, 96, and we were doing the, the book. And look, Hillsborough will always be raw and very pre prevalent and prominent in, in, in Kenny's thinking because he's a family man, because he's a Liverpool man, because he's a Merseyside man, because of his compassion for the families, four funerals. I mean, he and Marina would be coming back and they would just crash out on the sofa and, and be whistling or singing a vibe with me because that was the theme tune of their life as they held a club together, as they held a, a city and community, a grieving community together. And so just to listen to Kenny, that is, I would say, of the proudest of the millions of words I've ever written, the proudest is that Dalgleish Hillsborough chapter. Just listening, I just pressed play and Kenny spoke and it was, he spoke for about 40 minutes and you could have heard a pin drop. You could have heard a tear drop. It was just so, so powerful. And so that, and Mike, coming back finally to your point about the, the stories, just meeting Jenny Hicks, who lost her two beautiful daughters at, at Hillsborough, and talking to her and hearing her stories and hearing how this wasn't just one day. This has just stayed with her, the cover up, the loss of her, her kids, how it changed her life. She, she obviously broke up with her, with, with, with her husband. You know, they went to Hillsborough as a family with the two girls in the back and they came home as a couple. And just that, you know, anyone who suffered grief with their children, with someone close to them. So just that, just that, it's very humbling talking to the Hillsborough families, players, managers, and obviously the families like Jenny. Hard to follow on from that that question, but you you seem to have a, a, a an affinity towards Liverpool. Is that your team? Do you follow Liverpool? Are you a Liverpool fan? No, not really. I mean, a lot I, of Liverpool books. A lot of Liverpool books. Well, I've done Manchester United books. I've done Arsenal books. I mean, I'm a you know my answer phone says yes when. I mean, because I, I you know I'll do anyone's book. I'm I'm writing a couple at yeah. the, uh, <laughs> at, at, at the at the moment. Um, I, I just find it. Who do you again, support then, Henry? I, I'm not allowed. To, I'm you, not allowed you, to have a. Uh, of course you are. That's what I was Henry. Like Michael Richards. No, I would say England. <laughs> I would actually say genuinely England, and everyone laughs at that. But because because as a kid, I I didn't grow up in that. Let's go and stand on the terrace, you know, sort of rattling a, you know, and eating pies with my dad. I mean, my dad was down the Royal Academy and advising the Royal Family on architecture. So, I, I mean, it wasn't quite, <laughs> I didn't quite have that sort of yeah. upbringing. I just, to be honest, as a kid, all I did was play three times a weekend or, or sort of stand on the pitch and watch mm. the ball go over my head. So, no, I didn't have that club affiliate. But in terms of passion for England, I mean, you guys have got, what, 150, 152 caps between you, all the all those goals. Michael, you scored, so you're in there as, you know, you know the all Of course there. I am. <laughs> yeah, I remember that, Michael. You see their faces when he said that the yeah. caps, uh, that looked like to say, he's we only got, got 13 caps. We've got 79 England goals between us, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But, Michael, I can remember your debut, Amsterdam, you know, 
I mean, it was, I can remember... Oh, it. go on. You I, might as well talk us through it, Henry, if you, you remember it so it. well. Uh, Micah, I can, look, I, I really enjoyed your career. And look, one thing I'll say about you, Micah, which everyone says about you, is that after an interview with, with Micah Richards... He's a knobhead. <laughs> that, but he's, he's, he's a knobhead who makes you laugh, Alan. You know, you come out and you think, yeah. uh, well, <laughs> you know, but, but in the right way. You, you're just great. You're right. You're you know, right. He's just a very uplifting personality. Absolutely. And that's what I like in life. I don't, you know, I've got friends who've got amazing jobs, but I travel around the world. I meet amazing people who share, who have this passion, who can, who can exhibit this passion on a football pitch. So talking to Micah, talking to, to, to you guys as well, and talking to this current England generation, I mean, like Jordan Pickford, Jordan Pickford gets stick from some fans. I think he's comfortably England's number one. Whenever I see him, I think what a good down-to-earth character is. I have battered Harry Maguire over certain things, whether a mobility, whether uh, Mykonos, whatever the issues. And when you see Harry Maguire, he'll come up, he'll shake your hand, he'll look you in the eye, how are you, how's the family? And you think, Jesus Christ, there are so many good, good Good people, and the reaction on a very—it's not very... that. It's not that Henry he just doesn't read your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's true. That is for that's even the interviews I've done. You know, and I found that you know when I left the Times, the reaction from England players, past and present. You know, you guys. I mean, it was just. It's a fantastic profession to work in, partly because mm. we all love the game. I love how brilliantly you steered that away from my question about which team you support. England. I support England. I support I support England because because that is the only that's the only team I write about where where I actually write as much with my heart as with my head. Talking of England, um, where are we going into this tournament? Is this our best chance for a hell of a long time? We always say that we always do the sort of time to deliver pieces. We we yeah, we, but I think it's more of a realistic claim this time, isn't it? I think so. I think France are obviously the team to beat. They've got strength in each position. They've got Mbappé, they've got fabulous players, they've got a mindset, they've got a brilliant coach who knows what he's doing. Uh, I think Portugal, I mean, you look at their squad, you look at their run they had, you know, they were fabulous run in qualifying. So I think they will be a threat. But absolutely, with England, I don't think there are any problems with our front six. I mean, everyone's trying to work out how uh, Cole Palmer can get in it now. Will Cobby Mainu start? My gut feeling is that Southgate is a, is a little bit more conservative and he might go with a more sort of anchoring presence. He would absolutely love Calvin Phillips to sort of regain form and sharpness, but I, I think sadly... That, we can that's, have Calvin Phillips unlikely. and Jordan Henderson in there. That'll please the fans. <sighs> well, I mean, you're going you're gonna to have Declan <laughs> Rice in there. And then you've got this debate about out wide. People, out wide. So uh, I, I worry slightly about defence. You just hope Luke Shaw is going to be fit. But Carl Walker's the best right back in the world at the moment. And Trent Alexander-Arnold, who's probably our best passer, you know, how do you actually get him in the, the team... Um, you know, as well. So, look, England got a chance. I just hope, and I'm probably one of the few of Southgate's critics on this, that he's changed the culture, he's changed the mood. The shirt doesn't weigh heavily on the players anymore. The players want to go to St George's Park. They want to report. But I just hope that Southgate is decisive in those key moments, like the second half against Croatia at 2018, like early on in the, the second half against Italy when Mancini outmaneuvered him. Um, but absolutely, they've got a chance. Do you have concerns about um, Gareth Southgate t- tactically? Or I mean, he's done an amazing job, as you said, getting getting that togetherness and that um, camaraderie and that desire to play for England back. Although I, I've always argued that you know, pretty much everybody wants to play for their country. But um, do, do you have slight concerns over perhaps the negative or let's say cautious style of his um, uh, managerial approach? The cautious, because I think England need to go on the front foot. I think that's where the, the, the strength is. We've got one probably world-class centre-back in John Stones, a world-class right-back. I, I, I do have slight concerns about the defence. I, I have so much respect for, for Harry Maguire, but I think he has got a mistake in him. I think we've got a terrific goalkeeper in Jordan Pickford, who I can see, like Edison, taking a penalty at some point for England because he's got that, that confidence. Uh, I think there's a gap between England's number one and England's number two, which is probably Ramsdale. And, you know, he's not playing regularly enough, so there the, are the concerns there. Nick Pope might come back in touch with fitness-wise towards the end of the season. But, yeah, just on Southgate, I just hope he's bold at the key moments. He'll have had four tournaments, you know, and 
And look, the FA clearly want him to stay because they don't want to go through the rigmarole of finding another uh, coach. The players like him. You talk to the players on and off the record. They really like him. But would he walk into a top Champions League team? Is he on a par with Klopp or Pep, even Arteta? I don't think so. What's next for Henry Winter? <laughs> uh, we've got the London Marathon at the weekend. So probably Sunday, sort of hobbling around the streets of London. Have you Monday, run a marathon before? Yeah, this is my eighth and last, Gary. I've done two New Yorks. So this will be six London. Absolutely no more. I'm absolutely not built for it. But uh, So uh, Sunday running around London. Monday in A&E. Tuesday, um, I don't know, probably sort of hobbling <laughs> back. North. I don't know. I mean... <laughs> Uh, oh, absolutely! I've got uh, I've got a couple of books on the go. I'm going to the Euros, which in, which is important. I've got one or two things which will be announced further down the line. But uh, you know, it's actually it's been quite so humbling to take a step back from the sport and just and just be reminded how important it is for yourself, for everyone, and what a privilege it is to work in football, to work in the industry. I mean, the guys and, and women that I work with. That, you know, they're driving all over the country. They are getting quotes. They're doing great match reports. They're doing interviews. They're, their work ethic, because, you know, you don't do this job for the money. You do it because you're passionate about football and you're passionate about writing. And it's been, you know, it is an incredible privilege to, to cover your guys' careers, to cover so many careers. And also, I, it's an opportunity to explore the world. I've probably been to about 60, 70 countries in this job. I've interviewed so, so many players and what football provides me an opportunity to do it provides a window on society where we are in society racism discrimination of all forms uh you know child food poverty you know the world that i worked in you know mine was pure hogwarts in the middle of london we had such privilege then to hear from marcus rashford about the sort of you know the child food poverty in this country you think wow Football is a power for good, how it can change. You know, the work that, that, that you guys do in charity, you know, with what you do, the work that all the England players do, I think it's fantastic. And actually, I think if more of the country was like more of football, was like a united dressing room with no one cared about religion, no one cared about your sort of, you know, your background, your colour, you were all in it together. And there was a sort of unity there reflected by our brilliant dressing rooms. If that was reflected by the whole country, this country would be in a better place. Thank you so much uh, for giving us so, so much of your time. Uh, always a pleasure to talk to you and um, very unusual to interview. Yeah, it's normally yeah. obviously the other way around, but it's, uh, it's been a delight. Thank you very much. Yeah, and that was all off, that was all yeah. off the record. <laughs> yeah. oh, okay. so we can't use it oh damn <laughs> too late Brilliant. you should have told us at the start yeah. too late, Doom. Um, too late. Uh, that's, that's it for the uh, rest is football thank you very much to Henry Winter uh, goodbye from me goodbye from me goodbye from me thank you <laughs>